Hi everyone, it's MJ from Bible Intelligence and in this video we're going to give a lecture on this idea that there's only two types of churches. So for my church type 1, I'm going to be putting in Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, Reform and Mavarian. And then in church type 2, I'm going to be putting the following. The Baptists, the Seven-day Adventists, the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostals, the Munamites, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, the Church of the Nazarene, the Evangelicals, and I guess all the other non-denominational, you know, these are your mega churches that we see a lot of in America. So these are the two types of churches, and if I was to give each type a name, type 1 are known as the Sacrament, and type 2 are known as the Ordinance. And what we're going to be doing in this video is jumping in and seeing why I've drawn this distinct line between these two types of churches because normally people say, oh, there's so many different denominations out there in Christianity. And yes, there's many different types of denominations, but I'm going to be putting forth this view that there's only two types of churches. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm going to define Christianity as those who believe Jesus is God, who was crucified so that we could have forgiveness and that he rose from the dead. And I'm going to be looking at the church as this thing that has many different things depending on how you look at it. Theologically, it's the bride of Jesus. Sociologically, it is the collective of Christians in a society. Politically, it is the religious institution. Culturally, it's this place for group worship. And I guess where we're going to see the difference between our two types of churches is how they handle the ceremonies. So we're going to be seeing different forms or different views on how ceremonies should be performed within the church. And that type one, as we said before, is the sacrament. And type two is the ordinance. Now, this is all coming from Jesus' sayings. We're going to be looking at two of them. The one is in from Mark 16. He says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the other is coming from Luke 22, where Jesus says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So sacrament type one churches, they believe that these things that Jesus said are actually sacraments. So we've got... Uh, pedo baptism otherwise known as infant baptism we've got the eucharist also known as the holy communion and you know the different denominations have different number of sacraments sometimes they can include marriage confirmation holy orders anointing of the sick there's there's a whole bunch out there but most of them have got the baptism and the eucharist as these types of sacraments now you might be saying okay well what is a sacrament a sacrament is defined as the visible signs of God's grace. This means that there's divine power, power and spiritual energy in the actual deed. It's a means through which God's grace is actually imparted to the believer, and it can cause the salvation of the soul. Now, there are some historical links, specifically where we get the word sacrament from. Um, it comes from the word sacramentum, which was a sacred oath performed by Roman soldiers before they joined the military. And I mean, it's quite interesting looking at, say, Roman history. They also had something called the Lustario, which was this Roman military purification ritual involving water before and after a battle. And why I include it is because all the soldiers did this. It wasn't like you chose whether you did it or you didn't. It was like, no, this is what we all kind of did. And this is what we also see with, say, infant baptism or Holy Communion or confirmation. It tends to be a group of people doing this uh, sacrament kind of like at the same time. And it mirrors a lot of what was happening in Roman society, where, of course, you know, it's called the Roman Catholic Church, which is one of the main, if not the biggest denomination and the biggest denomination for the type one churches. Now, what this means for the church, if a church was to take on the sacrament view, is that it's going to be needing priests, it's going to be needing ordained clergy. You know, we need qualified spiritual leaders to perform these sacred rituals because, you know, there's the divine power and spiritual energy. We can't just let anybody go and do this. You have to be either chosen or trained in order to perform these sacred rituals. And this is why we see in these type 1 churches, there tends to be formal hierarchies, there's quite strict rules for Sunday service, and it's very important that these rules are followed when, you know, doing the sacrament, when handing out Holy Communion, when going through the notions of baptism. 
Now, because the church controls you know, the mechanism of salvation, which is the sacraments, they tended historically to have very strong political influence. Even Martin Luther, when he kind of broke away with the whole Reformation, had political ties to the German uh, princes, and they kind of like continued that. That's why even though the Lutherans are Protestants, they still believe that the Eucharist actually is the blood of Christ, and it's a very sacred, you know, there's, it's, it's a sacrament. There is that spiritual energy in the deeds, and there is this need for priests and all these type of things. Now, what does this mean for believers? So if you're part of the type one churches, what does this mean if you're part of this whole thing with the sacraments? Well, what this means is that from this angle, salvation is seen as a gift. God chose you. That's why you were baptized as a baby. You didn't have to make the decision. You simply received God's grace. Now, psychologically, this can make it easier to have faith as you have these physical experiences of God's divine grace. You're actually partaking in this spiritual energy. Now, some more benefits of the sacraments is that there's this community inclusion. Like I said, people tend to do this in, in groups. Uh, there's the sense of tradition. It introduces the sacredness and this mystery element to one's religion, and it can provide them with the spiritual assurance saying, okay, I know I'm saved because I've done baptism. I've had the first Holy Communion. I'm all good. So there's a lot of benefits for both the church and the believers for having this idea of the sacrament. Now we're going to be looking at the type 2 churches who follow this idea of the ordinance. Now we've got the type of ordinance, we've got credo baptism or otherwise known as believer baptism, and we have the breaking of bread otherwise known as the Lord's Supper, which is I guess also it's you know holy communion and the Lord's Supper are both based on what Jesus was saying in Luke 22. So it's interesting to see how the ceremony is performed so differently, um, like I say, in these two different types of churches. So what do we mean by this term ordinance? Again, it's a sacrament, ordinance. Uh, these are not words we come across in our everyday language. So we're going to be defining an ordinance as a symbolic action that represents a believer's faith. Okay, so this whole idea is that there isn't any magic in the deed, and I'm putting that in quotations. You know, there is no presence of necessarily God in the Lord's Supper, or when you have the baptism, it's not like, you know, there's going to be this huge spiritual moment. Instead, it's done out of obedience to Jesus. Now, the historical link and why a lot of churches, uh, well, the, the second group of churches follow this is because this is more similar to Judaism. So the Jewish rituals are more similar to the concept of ordinance rather than that of the sacraments. And I mean, even with the mekvev uh, ritual, I apologize for mispronouncing that, was this ritual washing with living water to achieve symbolic purity. So like I say, the, a lot of the Jewish uh, deeds and rituals are more similar to this idea of ordinance as being these symbolic actions rather than as being, say, a sacrament where there is power in the actual deed. So what does this mean for the church? Well, what we're going to be seeing in these type 2 churches is that there isn't really a priesthood or special rules around those who preach. If anything, the laymen can be the elders, the laymen can come up and, and speak, and it's not like, oh, you can't get married, or you can't do this, or you can't do that. It's kind of like a little bit of a, a free-for-all around the leadership. Uh, so we do see informal structures, we see less rules around Sunday service, they tend to be more flexible. And also church is therefore seen as simply the gathering of the saints and there isn't any necessarily political control. Although I do put that in a bit of an asterisk because today that might be changing, you know, with saying in America, um, looking at some of the denominations that are type two, as well as in South America, there is starting to become this political creep. But that's more from the idea that there are just a lot of Christians and politically it makes sense to pander to them in order to get their vote. But the church institution is not, like I said, this, that in fact, a lot of type two churches believe in this idea of the separation between church and state where your type one churches tended to have a bit of a mix of those two um, organs of society. 
Now, what does this mean for, for believers? Well, here the big, big difference is that salvation is seen as a choice. So you choose God. Why? Because I'm baptizing myself, well, not myself, but I'm choosing to be baptized as a believer. So with the sacraments you simply received, with the ordinance you need to ask. You need to go up and say, hey, I want to partake of the Lord's Supper. I want to eat the breaking of the bread, or I want to get baptized. The church doesn't like put you through the motions. You have to opt into it. Now, psychologically, this does give believers a greater sense of authenticity. And there's also that flexibility on how to express one's spiritual side. Do you want to get baptized in a river? Do you want to get baptized in a pool? You know, these are some of the choices that you can do uh, with, when it comes to breaking of the bread. You can choose what type of bread. You can choose if there's going to be wine or grape juice. You know, there's not as many rules as we see with the sacraments. And I guess for a lot of believers, this makes it just easier to understand. You know, these actions are simply a symbol and it can lead to yeah, less confusion on how spirituality works and what, you know, what is grace and why is it in these objects. And like I say, a lot of believers do find it easier to understand. So if I was to draw a diagram trying to compare sacrament to ordinance, I guess with the sacrament, it's this idea that, like I say, God comes down to man and he gives this gift of grace through the church, which then gives it to the congregation. Whereas with the ordinance, it's kind of like the other way around. The, the layman and the church are kind of at the same spiritual level. You know, the church is not higher than that of the people. And together they come to God and they do these acts, these deeds, uh, these ordinances out of obedience to say to God, hey, we're coming to you. We're choosing to do them in order to draw closer to you. Where, like I say, in the sacrament churches, these deeds tend to be done to you. Hence why uh, babies are getting baptized because there is no need for them to make the choice. This is this gift of grace. Whereas with ordinance, the believer uh, needs to be of a certain age in order to make the decision themselves because that's how they kind of see it. So which one is better? And I guess that's a very dangerous question to ask because both have pros and cons. I mean, we've spoken a lot about the pros in the previous slides, but I guess some of the cons or criticisms that we do see is that the sacraments can sometimes be criticized for being superstitious. You know, people say, oh, you're believing in magic or there's a, you know, there's some sort of manner or spiritual elements to these deeds that can maybe lead to taken to an extreme as being superstitious. Whereas sometimes the ordinance can be criticized for not taking Jesus's words seriously enough. And sometimes it's criticized to say, you know, Jesus did say, this is my bread. Uh, sorry, this is my body. You know, this is my blood while he's holding the bread and, and the wine. And ordinance are criticized for trying to water down Jesus's word by turning into a symbolic act um, when Jesus kind of makes this, this declaration. So both of them have their pros. Both of them can be criticized. From a Christian position, okay, you can favor one over the other. And that's why I wanted to talk about the psychological benefits. The one that you feel is better for you or better for your family is the one that you should go with. Okay, and I really want to urge everyone to appreciate the other position. So if you're big on sacraments, appreciate the ordinance view. Or if you're like, no, I think ordinance is, is the right way to go, great, but also appreciate the benefits of the sacraments. Show humility. I mean, this is a big thing that sometimes Christians have, is they have all these internal fights with each other on which way is right or how it should be done. But let's show humility. We don't know all the answers, and we can learn from Christians who are different to us. So let's not attack each other, let's rather learn from each other, because ultimately that's how we can show love. Okay, so I don't want to hear anyone declaring that a different denomination is not Christian um, or that, you know, we're better than them. So we need to actually stop this us versus them mentality. And it's, it's interesting because sometimes you'll see this within type one churches, the different denominations within type one even have some, you know, internal fighting amongst themselves when dealing with more nuanced theological concepts. But my 
message to everyone would be let's show humility let's show love let's appreciate the other's position and not declare that our one is superior we can favor but we shouldn't think that the other position is inferior to the one that we go with and yeah if you're keen to learn more about christianity then i'd really want to recommend you to subscribe to not only this channel but to join us on patreon patreon there's a lot more books there's some audio files there's going to be some cool ai tools that we're going to be launching there is a seven day free membership so that you can go and you can download some books check it out like i say for seven days all for free and if you do join one of the payment methods and it's pay what you feel so there's different amounts at different tiers you can pay however much value you think this thing is bringing to you but what you'll see is that if you come to patreon not only do we have the shop where there's multiple products um, a lot of the products you can get on youtube as well for free but there are going to be some products that are exclusive to patreon but one of the other big benefits of joining patreon is the community that we're going to start to to grow there so if you've got questions about the sacrament, you've got questions about ordinance, or you just want to learn from the other point of view, or you want to make a case, or, or whatever type of discussion you want to have, we can have that in Patreon. And when you have a little bit of a paywall, you can prevent trolls and you know people who don't necessarily, or maybe coming in there with the wrong intentions. So check out Patreon, subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you soon for another video. Keep well, everyone. Cheers.